there. Um, so Jared, I'll hand it straight over to you, I think, and you can maybe introduce yourself a little bit and uh, share what you're going to be talking about. Yeah. Okay. So um, here, one second, let me adjust this really quick. Thanks everyone for coming. I think I really appreciate being, first of all, being invited here and also everyone who wants to learn more about Honduras, because I think it's, um, there's a lot of people who are suffering in that country, obviously, right? And it's also at the same time, kind of like a perfect window to understand injustices, not just there, but throughout Latin America and even in the global South, because a lot of those injustices are so extremely pronounced in Honduras, right? So I am a writer and independent journalist. Um, I have been covering Central America on and off um, more consistently in the last year, but for about two and a half years now and Southern Mexico. And I started in the last year and a half covering Honduras, right? For the reasons I just laid out because the injustices there are so extreme, which is also one of the reasons why there are so many people who flee the country. Um, if you've, I know that we have a few people in the chat who've been to Honduras. Um, if you go anywhere and talk to anyone in Honduras, I guarantee they will know someone who, a family member who has left to the United States or they have themselves done it and been deported. It's a normal thing. And if you spend time in Honduras, it's really not hard to figure out why, right? Um, so, I mean, something interesting, and I think this is a appropriate point of departure to understand how a lot of this stuff works in Honduras, right? Um, in the US, as I'm sure many of us already know, uh, a standard rejoinder used to demonize immigrants is, if only they fixed their own countries, right? If only they started a business, if only they tried to stop the violence or stop being so violent, right? Um, and that's, of course, aside from being horrendously racist, um, it's very common to hear variations on that same kind of idea, which is born of ignorance here in the US, right? Um, so maybe let's jump to a second point. It's not that these people try to fight for justice in their own country, it's that they are consistently repressed in their efforts to do so. So in June 28th, 2009, right, there was a military coup in Honduras. Um, if you go to Honduras, people refer to it in the same way that people in the US refer to 9-11, um, even more so because I would say, I would argue that the effects are felt more, more powerfully there, right? There had been a center left president named Manuel Zelaya, who was, he was a centrist, right? He really wasn't some radical socialist, um, but he had been moving a little bit to the left and acceding to the demands of social movements in Honduras from 2006 onwards, right? Not even being radical, just like listening to social movements, grassroots uh, organizations to try to create a more equitable society, right? Um, and he had also made gestures towards rewriting the constitution that had been written by a military junta in the 1980s for their transition to democracy. He was overthrown. Uh, the military showed up at his house with M16s, kidnapped him in his pajamas and flew him to Costa Rica, right? It was done autonomously by the oligarchy in Honduras, which has been sustained by US support for a hundred years ever since the US really became an empire, so to speak, in Latin America, right? Um, it wasn't directly, from what we understand, directly orchestrated by the US government, but it uh, was immediately supported by the US government, right? So the oligarchy, which feels fearful of Manuel Zelaya, and also you have to remember at this time context, uh, Latin America is shifting to the left. You have Hugo Chavez, Evo Morales and stuff. And there's some conversations about if they're really left wing or whatever. But um, so yeah, the oligarchy overthrows him and immediately you have these governments that come to power, uh, temporarily a guy named Micheletti and then Porfirio Lobo and now Juan Orlando Hernandez. These are illegitimate governments um, who are now we understand engaged in narco trafficking, um, directly engaged in the drug traffic there are extreme right-wing governments who are imposing this kind of dystopian corporate vision of how to remake the entire face of their country. And the country has become, ever since that coup, one of the most violent places in the world outside of a war zone, right? Um, and it stayed that way. Ever since 2014, the government stopped counting a lot of the murders, right? So now, because they wanted to lose that, you know, distinction. So now they say, oh, we're only number 10, right? But people who actually look at the numbers know that it's still like right up there with like Venezuela, um, other places that are extremely violent. 
So um, I think I prevaricate, right? Just some other things to remember, Honduras is incredibly underdeveloped. It was first, you know, uh, sucked of its resources by the Spaniards and then by US hegemony and stuff. And that continues to this day. Um, so I'll just talk about some of the stuff that I've reported on there because I think it's, those are appropriate windows to understand the ways that these people working to fix their countries are actively repressed, right? So um, in, it's not something you hear as much in the United States um, because I don't think it's as explicit in the United States, but in Latin America, you hear a lot of people talking about extractive industries. Um, these, pr the proliferation of these massive open pit mines, um, the proliferation of very rank and violent oil extraction and stuff. And you have that in the first world, of course, um, and there's, you know, pipeline protests and stuff like that, right? But it is just very explicitly uh, happening in Latin America because they have such lax uh, regulation and in countries like Honduras, which are extreme right wing, there are very little to no regulations on how these industries can operate, right? So there's one part of the country known as the Bacuaguan Valley. Um, right now, there is this battle going on between these campesino or rural people, environmentalists, and this giant iron mine being created by Inversiones Pinares, uh, a company which is supported by the Honduran government and the Honduran military. It's turned into a massive brawl over the past few years. 10 people have died, if I recall correctly, nine or 10. Um, when I was just there a month ago, they had killed a guy two days before we got there, right? The killings are kind of mysterious and this is a systematic thing where it's very difficult to understand how each of these environmentalists killed, but it's a standard thing. So these environmentalists get criminalized for organizing to stop the construction of this mine, which will poison their watersheds, their rivers, right? In 2018, they set up a roadblock to try to stop the construction because you got to remember these people were never consulted about the construction of this mine in the first place. It's an illegitimate government. Um, I, I prevaricate again, but uh, there's an important context to understand why these governments are illegitimate, right? Aside from the fact that they are, there's evidence in a New York court case that the president's brother was using the Honduran military to bring cocaine into the United States, cocaine and automatic weapons or something. That's in a US court case. But in the last two presidential elections, there was massive fraud uh, in 2013 and 2017. The computer shut off and then suddenly like when the computers came back on, uh, the current de facto dictator, Juan Orlando Hernandez was winning massively, right? What a shock. And in 2017, um, this is, in it's why people in Honduras refer to it as a narco dictatorship. It's not a democracy anymore. In 2017, when people rose up and nonviolent, and sometimes they rioted too, right? Uh, against this illegitimate election, about 50 to 70 people were killed by state security forces, many of them via death squad style executions, right? If only they fixed their countries, if only, you know what I mean? So going back to the mining, that just, it's a, some important context to understand about Honduras and why it's so illegitimate and why, how violent this government is. So the people, after not being consulted about the construction of this mine, they set up a big roadblock to try to stop um, the construction because it's going to be created in the middle of a national park. Overnight in 2013, uh, they had a secret, almost secret congressional hearing, which they resized this national park. So there could be a little square in the middle of it where this mining corporation could come in and start laying out uh, a mining concession. They make the blockade and then finally the military shows up and they repress them. And one guy dies, eight people got shot um, and then they chased them into uh, several villages as the people dispersed, right? This is a standard thing in Honduras that actually happens after protesting or after protesters are dispersed, the military police will chase them to their villages and they'll shoot tear gas into their houses because they just hate them. Um, so anyways, to avoid going on too long about that. Um, so they continued organizing to try to stop this mine. They had a big community, community meeting, what's called the Cabildo Abierto in November, 2019, in which they roundly voted and roundly rejected the presence of this mining company, which is going to destroy their water. The construction continues. 
There are still trucks going through. They're still building this massive processing facility beneath the national park where they're having the mining concession, you know, being planned and stuff. So democracy doesn't work in the context of a narco dictatorship, right? When I was there a month ago, um, this is part of a larger phenomenon that I can talk about after this, but there are paramilitary squads that exist in these rebellious communities. Um, I'll have to give a little bit of context after this. When I was in Guapinol, they, several people told us, most of them who wanted to be off the record, that there are, asides from the constant army patrols through their community, I mean, these communities are militarized to the hilt because they organize against these extractive projects. Asides from the patrols of the army coming through, one guy told me that there was 70 soldiers who came through in Humvees with big, you know, floodlights intimidating the people, right? Um, normal thing. That there's about five to seven guys in there, um, several of them with automatic weapons, but also just with some shotguns and pistols. And they go walk around and they patrol the community and stuff. And they, so one woman who I will not name told me, she's prominent, I can't say more than that, but she told me that she's prominent in the struggle against the mine. These men came to her house and when there was a power outage, sprayed her house with automatic weapon fire. I'm sure they wouldn't have cared if she died, but the point was to scare the, scare the expletive out of her, right? Um, so this is part of a systematic strategy that the Honduran state has been engaged in, whereby in each of these communities that organize nonviolently to defend either their water, their land, the right to collective land ownership, they have these paramilitary squads which have infiltrated the community and which all evidence indicates are connected to the Honduran special forces known as the Zatrush. Um, this is, so many of you guys, if you're on this chat, you may know who Berta Cáceres is. She was an incredibly prominent uh, leader of the social movements in Honduras who was assassinated in 2016, March, 2016. And she was assassinated by what was in essence a de facto death squad organized by ex-army officers in collaboration with this uh, dam company in collaboration with everyone believes the Honduran government, right? And that's part of the same kind of intertwinement of these ex-military officers who work in collaboration with the military, with the military, with drug war hitmen. Um, they all collaborate together is what I'm saying. And this has been a systematic strategy to make sure that they can terrorize these communities. Um, so anyways, let me check the time. I don't, I can go on forever, right? Um, so yeah, we went back and the people are incredibly brave, I should say, covering these, or not covering, the people are incredibly brave, still organizing against, for example, Inversiones Pinares, the mining company that's going to poison their water. Something interesting, actually, um, I don't wanna get off too much into the rabbit hole, but there was an investigation that came out by Univision, the Latin American um, publication, a few weeks ago that revealed that this mining company was actually being subsidized by a US steel company uh, through a subsidiary, basically a fake company in Panama called Nucor Steel. And Nucor Steel is favored by the US President Donald Trump, right? Um, so it's the kind of thing where we can suspect that this sort of support by transnational capitalists of these scummy corporations is far more prominent than we see. And with more and more investigations like this that come out, we realize that, you know, the situation is really ugly. Um, so just moving on to some other subjects and then I would prefer, I think it'd be more productive to have a Q and A. Um, I've also been covering MS-13 a little bit for Vice News. I have a piece coming out this week. Um, our story that we did for Vice News is on how MS-13, Actually, I should rewind a little bit. For those of us who don't know what MS-13 is, MS-13 is a criminal gang trying to become a criminal organization. Uh, it was frequently invoked by President Trump to demonize immigrants and say we should retrench the border, retrench state violence at the border, because look at these savage immigrants, they're bringing MS-13, right? The ironic thing is that MS-13 was created in the United States. It was created by traumatized teenage war refugees of US backed wars in the 1980s in Central America, mostly Salvadorans. They went to South Central LA, Southern California in the 80s and early 90s um, 
And to defend themselves because they were so poor and they were refugees, they got into these groups, self-defense groups basically, that then became criminal gangs and they were forced to fight off other gangs such as the Bloods and the Crips and stuff like that. In the early 90s, this burgeoning gang known as the Mara Salvatrucha, MS-13, is deported back to Central America after Central America was destroyed by these US-backed wars, right? The area, there are no social structures to which people can turn if they need help, right? The churches were destroyed. This is a whole other history, right? Central America was destroyed by these wars and also inundated with military grade weapons. These gangs come back into this environment, which is this fecund environment for the growth of criminal groups. And ever since then, MS-13 has been growing and growing and growing. And of course they have a limited presence presence in the United States, but nothing like what Republicans or even some Democrats would imply, right? They're mostly focused in Central America, but in the context of Central America, they commit very terrifying acts of violence to maintain their control over slums, to, um, yeah, to just try to expand and grow, which is what MS-13 is doing right now. So I return back to our reporting on MS-13. So MS the story we were working on is how MS-13 in an attempt to become a cartel, as opposed to just kind of a street gang, um, they are selling a form of chemically altered marijuana that's incredibly powerful and that they're making astronomically larger amounts of money off of than they would normally cocaine or uh, normal weed, right? And they have been engaged in very militarized offensives to take back territory from the other gangs to try to be able to sell this drug more, right? Um, we were with some of the guys on what they call La Frontera, the front lines with the other gang, right? And they have AR-15s. We didn't see them, but they also have AK-47s, like fully military grade weapons. And there are frequent like gun battles and stuff that take place uh, as they fight into new territory where they can sell their drug, right? Drugs. Um, yeah, so, and they get these weapons, I should say, uh, everyone that we asked about it, this was in the focus of our reporting, they get their weapons either from the Honduran police because corruption is so widespread. Corruption, I should say, I have to insert this, corruption doesn't exist there because Hondurans are somehow inherently stupid or you know racist or whatever. It exists for systemic reasons, and I guarantee Americans would do the same thing if they were in this situation. Nonetheless, corruption is there. So they get their machine guns from the Honduran military, from, or police, from the Nicaraguans, interestingly, and from the Cartel Jalisco de Nueva Generación, a cartel in Mexico. Um, yeah, and there are large strips of barrios or slums, right, that are actually abandoned because the shootouts are so frequent. Anyways, um, so we spent time with them doing this. There's a few points I wanna to touch on that and let's go to Q and A. Um, the interesting thing, me and Antonia were talking about this earlier, is that with the gangsters, right? Um, when you talk to some of these guys, and of course I was talking with them for a few days, um, this is where I'm, I have to preface this, I'm not going to justify MS-13. They engage in violent criminal acts and they murder many people. And we saw some of that and it's very upsetting. But they are human beings put into this meat grinder of a social situation in which I would guarantee if any cross section of humanity was placed in these slums and had to grow up there, at least a certain quantity of people would join the Mara Salvatrucha, the gang, right? And the interesting thing is that a lot of these guys, on the one hand, so we, without getting into too much detail, we did see a killing um, or the aftermath of that, right? And we saw some figures who were there taking videos in the immediate aftermath of dead bodies, right? It's kind of like a propaganda win for the gang, you know, let's, and they had this dark fascination and satisfaction to see these bodies that are just totally disfigured by gunfire, right? Um, really screwed up. I mean, I, there's some things that I would say about that that I can't, you know, expletives galore that I can't say about how messed up that is. At the same time, um, we would see some of those same figures later hanging out with their two-year-old children and their wives and grandmas and laughing and changing their kids' diapers and making dinner and seeming like decent human beings. There is a duality between someone's role in the gang, right? And also just their normal everyday life. And I think that, you know, when it comes to 
MS-13. And I'm not an expert. I should say I'm not an expert on any of this stuff. I've been learning it for the past year and a half. With MS-13, um, we have to drop this perception of them as these un remittingly violent evil people because i think that you know as we saw even people there's this terrible contradiction people who commit terribly violent acts still are actually human beings too and you have to recognize that humanity and instead look at the systematic injustices uh economic impoverishment militarization that causes so many people to join these gangs in the first place because that's the only way you can dismantle the gangs but more importantly the violence that you know they produce uh and the violence that produced them right one last note on ms13 let's go to q a um there are certain things in journalism that like so I, i'm saying this because it's a q a or because it's a informal lecture there are certain things that when you hear a story enough times from enough different people that you can be relatively certain that there is a strong chance that thing is true right something that we would hear a lot in the slums controlled by ms13 is that the military police. Now, I, I don't want to justify any of the actors in this, right? But again, it's about understanding why people do these things. In each of these slums, in San Pedro Sula, uh, the slums are like on a riverbed, right? Um, and there are military installations above them. You know, um, generally it's what's called the PMOP, so the military police, and they're terrifying. You know, they have, they look like soldiers in Afghanistan, right? And they go on patrols through the contested territory between the gangs and in the communities and stuff. We would hear stories about people who would say they come down here and they pull out a gangster, they'll do an execution of the gangster. And this is I'm not justifying. It's because they hate these guys, right? Like the gangsters murder people. So of course the military police go shoot them against the wall. And then people would say, and then they take their packs of cocaine, their weed, and they go sell it themselves. It's a narco dictatorship. So why can't you know the soldiers get in on the, the profits from the drugs too? Um, death squads actually do operate very actively in Honduras. Um, last thing I'll say, I've said the last thing like the last three times, right? Um, there was a report that emerged in 2016 um, in the Guardian, right? A deserter from the Honduran special forces who escaped the country said to a journalist, Nina Lakani, that there were death squads being operated by the Zatrush special forces. And some of the details of what these guys were being forced to do. I mean, they were truly horrifying. So the Zatrush is like the elite of the elite for the military. It's Zatrush and Fusina are the two, like the Navy SEALs of Honduras, right? Um, part of the training is that you actually have to raise a dog, love the dog, and then you have to kill the dog with a knife and eat it raw, right? Um, soon after they finished the training, yeah, soon after they finished the training for this, this guy, the deserter who went to Mexico, he said, they started injecting us with drugs and then I couldn't tell what was right or wrong. I was raised Christian, but then I couldn't feel like a Christian after that. And he talks about how on bases, which I should mention, bases where US Green Berets have done training for these forces, he saw a room that was spattered with blood um, full of tools that looked like they were used for torture. Um, one of his missions, aside from patrolling these Campesino communities, like we saw from the other direction, you know, the patrols through the anti-mine communities. One of the tasks that he was given was to go take a bag and dump it into the river, a river full of crocodiles. So he goes, um, he dumps the bag and it's full of human body parts, right? They were a death squad and they are one of the groups actively implicated in killing social movement leaders. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty horrifying. And I, I apologize if that's graphic or anything like that, but I really think it's important that Americans especially, but people in general understand what's going on down there. Um, and the interesting thing is that, so when you see a lot of media coverage of Honduras, right? There's this tendency, especially among kind of like liberal elite, I say liberal in the sense of like centrist, right? Liberal elites publications like the New York Times, the Washington Post to, treat all of this violence as some tragic accident. Oh, the horror, the brown people, they're just killing each other. Oh, so sad, they're so stupid. The stupid part is the subtext, right? Because when you refuse to explain why there's this violence, such as death squads operating, such as mass impoverishment that forces people into gangs, 
then the subtext is automatically, well, these people are just inherently savage, right? Why would they kill each other so much? Why is everyone leaving? There was a piece that even came out. Um, I don't want to name the author. You can find it. Oh, who cares? It's Elizabeth Malkin wrote the piece. Um, it was a commentator former journalist who seems to have done some really good stuff in Honduras, but she wrote a piece the other day uh, that was an op-ed about Honduras and how corruption uh, hindered the uh, relief efforts, right, after the hurricanes, which the hurricanes were catastrophic, as I'm sure you know. But then the corruption just stopped when she described corruption, she stopped at the level of Honduras. She didn't mention the fact that this government which killed 70, 50 to 70 protesters in 2017 after stealing a second election would not exist if it was not subsidized by the State Department, would not be able to do what it's doing if it didn't receive $60 million in military assistance this past April, right? These governments, these corrupt governments would not exist were it not for the US overlooking them, overlooking their crimes and their killings, right? So you see this piece that came out the other day is a perfect emblematization of how depoliticized reporting on the region that just treats it all as a tragic accident really just serves to create this false racist narrative of savage Hondurans killing each other, right? Um, so I hope that, you know, I, I'm one of many journalists, I hope that can try to reverse that narrative. Um, and yeah, I think it's a good time to open it up for questions. Um, I hope that that was informative. Yeah, thanks, Jared. I really also appreciate your anger at seeing how systemic the reasons behind the situation that Honduras is in are. Um, and I think you've done a great job of giving a sort of overview of the, the extreme um, injustices and, and structural injustices and structural violence that, that Honduras finds itself in. Um, does anybody have uh, a question for? You can ask anything. <laughs> I can jump in, I've got one. Uh, thanks, Jared, for a really nice explanation there. Um, you were saying that like the US government in some way supports or overlooks the Honduran uh, crimes or their government with dodgy elections, et cetera. Could you elaborate on that a bit more? Because I didn't quite get the story there. I know that maybe yeah, it's happening, yeah. but when did that start? Why is it happening? So sure. Um, the interesting thing, there's a deep history of US support of the Honduran regimes, right? An appropriate starting point to understand this would be to go back to the 1980s um, when Honduras was actually basically under de facto US military occupation because this was the era of the Contra war when they needed to wage uh, war against the Sandinista government in Nicaragua, right? Um, so they sent a ton of US soldiers to Honduras to militarize it and maintain control. And the joke, Hondurans actually say that back in the 80s, Honduras was the USS Honduras, sort of like this aircraft carrier of US power in the region. There's also a massive US military base that's uh, positioned in Honduras, which is kind of one of the focal points for US military power in the Western hemisphere. Um, it's called Palmarola Air Base and they have like B-52s that fly there and stuff. A lot of the planes that go um, circle Venezuela and stuff, right? They And Venezuela has real problems too. I don't wanna justify that government. Um, they fly out of Honduras, right? So anyways, um, yeah, starting in the eighties, they rely heavily on US military aid. And this continues up into the nineties and two thousands, right? Um, you have the massive military aid to Honduras. And like I said, April of this year, they received $60 million in uh, military aid again, which goes usually to guns, right? Um, they could totally use it for, at the time, for example, they had a very corrupt, um, I wrote a piece on this, a very corrupt food distribution program for the beginning of quarantine, right? Uh, but instead of getting, you know, aid for food distribution, right, they get aid for military, and they're not even at war, supposedly, although the Honduran military looks like it's at war by their actions and stuff. So I don't wanna drag on too long. You have the military aid, which continues immensely because Honduras geopolitically is a strategic place in the hemisphere and you have the financial aid. So the IMF, which I don't know if you guys know about it, it's an international monetary institution. Um, if I were to generalize, it's basically an institution that first world countries use to extort third world countries, right? When they get in debt, the IMF, which is basically a representative of the US and Great Britain, um, they go to them and they say, all right, well, we'll give you debt relief as long as you guys um, 
privatize your schools, which means that no one will be able to go to college. Or if you privatize your healthcare system, that actually started a huge wave of riots in Honduras in April, 2019, right? Um, so yeah, if you've got the military aid, which is massive, and then the financial aid, and then also diplomatically, like, so SOCOM, um, not SOCOM, I'm forgetting, SOUTHCOM, uh, the Southern Command of the US military frequently shares pictures of their generals with Juan Orlando Hernandez, this guy who benefited from two successively fraudulent elections, right? So I think that I hope that that's a good explanation, more detailed of why, you know, um, uh, yeah, like this regime really does depend on the US to exist. No, that was perfect, actually, thank you. Yeah, I think it's several angles to it there, yeah. What are you I think also just to to add to that, to the the role of the U.S. in the coup in two thousand nine, yeah. and the fact that they backed that and continue to support the governments that you know are widely held to be illegitimate is also their their continued support for these regimes and their continued acceptance of what's going on and not you know as you were saying continuing to have you know photos with with Juan Orlando and and to support um, through funding but also you know, politically not not making any statements against any of the, the, the massive corruption scandals that come up again and again and again and again over the years. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Add... Oh, Sorry, go ahead. go ahead, go ahead. I just, I remembered something that is an interesting anecdote about your question, USAID. Um, and this also feeds into terrible media coverage of Honduras, right? The New York Times did a story in 2011 um, in the about milit US military actions in the Aguan Valley, which is where that mine was located uh, that I was talking about. But in the early 2010s, it was home to a land conflict that like basically there was a campaign of assassinations and about 150 social leaders were just massacred over four years, right? Um, but the New York Times did a story about US Green Berets training the same Honduran special forces implicated in assisting in these assassinations. And the title, which is why media coverage can be so terrible, the title was US Lessons from Iraq Help Fight a Drug War in Honduras, right? Even though it was clear what they were doing was not actually stopping drugs, they're actually facilitating drug traffic. That's another story. They're just taking this training from the US and using it to help kill people. That's a whole nother thing, but yeah, interesting. Yeah interesting point we've got a couple questions here in the chat yeah, yeah, um yeah. just to bring up one that's come up a couple times what is the the prospect is there hope going forward is there sort of a light at the end of the tunnel i think when you're looking at sort of the fact that you have this state that completely disregards the most vulnerable populations you have people that are standing up like with the mining conflict that you're talking about who are being murdered um and with with utter impunity and and yet if people don't you know, stand up for these rights and continue to, to have these movements. There's, you know, the outward migration and then the criminalization, both of the movements and of the migrants. What, what do you think there is any, I mean, this is a massive question, but do you think there is any, like, what's the way forward here? Yeah, so as a journalist, I, you know, I, I'm not gonna stop at this answer, right? As a journalist, you have to avoid kind of like diagnosing things and then saying, you know, what's the path forward because then you're wandering into other territory, even though neutral journalism is BS. Um, as a human being though, and as someone who deeply cares about Honduras, I think they're kind of at least, I gotta find the right way to say this. They're pretty screwed, honestly. I think you should be honest. Um, I, th they struggle beautifully, right? And I think that there may be circumstances unforeseen that I mean, I'm not an expert, so I don't want to dismiss at all. There may be a juncture in the near future, or hopefully the Biden administration will not do what Obama and Biden both did and support the Honduran regime, hopefully with pressure. That's a whole other conversation about, you know, Biden and Latin America, right? Um, short story is that he's terrible towards Latin America or has been. Um, anyways, um, yeah, so I, I really don't want to pretend that I know what could happen to make things better, right? I mean, I think the big thing is that Hondurans are already struggling. I mean, like there are protests almost every day for myriad reasons in the country. Like if you actually go onto social media networks because this stuff doesn't trickle up to media uh, or international media per se, right? There are always road blockades because the government is so corrupt because they're not helping give food distribution relief, you know, for the quarantine because they are 
building a mine or a dam that they didn't ask the people to do. Um, so Hondurans are struggling. What needs to change is the US needs to stop supporting this puppet government that allows it to project its, and that's the big elephant in the room. I, I don't see change happening unless the US stops doing that. Yeah, absolutely. There's a question from Dr. Kaufman saying, do you think there's a way to reach out to the incoming State Department and petition for new policies for Honduras? Do we have an active embassy there? Um, yeah, by the way, Dr. Kaufman is a professor of mine from college. She's brilliant and has informed a lot of the ways I see the world. So shout out to her. But um, so I think obviously that is without question something that needs to be done because now that Biden is in power, they need to be pushed to not support the Honduran regime. And whatever you think, I mean, me personally, I'm a democratic socialist, right? But nonetheless, I can't change the fact that they're, he's the president, right? Um, so you have to do what you can to petition them to not support. However, um, I do think I, I have limited faith in the extent to which he will deviate from the previous Obama-Biden policy towards Central America. Because, and here's why, right? There's a certain narrative, especially among, again, like liberal internationalists, um, kind of these neoliberal figures such as Obama, Biden, going back to like Bill Clinton, right? In Latin America, they always talk about, well, we need to fight corruption, right? Um, they just talk corruption, corruption, corruption. But the interesting thing is that, so they're working from this narrative. This is a whole other conversation. They're working from this narrative that you have good governments, right? And you have the bad cartel, right? The drug traffickers, they're separate, right? And when you see these, uh, this evidence of corruption, right? It's because the bad cartel is so bad, it's working its way into the government, right? Um, when there's evidence of death squads, like there was in Honduras, when there's evidence of the government killing people, right? The narrative always comes back to not the government wants to kill these people or has legitimate economic interests for doing it. It's always that oh my God, this is further evidence that drug traffickers have infiltrated the governments. So we need to send them more guns, right? We need to send them more training so they can, you know what I mean? They're working from this false narrative that the governments were good and then infiltrated by these separate actors rather than these governments have distinct economic interests in using violence to impose transnational capitalism and stuff. And I think my gut feelings that Biden can be pushed as he should be, but I don't think he's going to deviate too much from that narrative of corruption is bad, so let's send them more guns so they can fight corruption, you know? And do you think there's, I mean, obviously there is a lot of opposition in Honduras. Um, a question from Flory, do you think that, that, that there is a relevant part of your movement that could actually become a, a meaningful opposition um, or that is a meaningful opposition to the existing regime? Yeah, so um, this is actually a huge debate in Honduras and it kind of, for a lot of the social movement people, it really stings when they talk about this. So you have the coup in 2009. Also, it's worth saying, a lot of people in Honduras say the coup never ended, right? Because they're still living with that sort of violence. And I think that's something that really needs to be re-emphasized, hit home. Um, in terms of political parties, so after the coup happens, they created what was called the Frente Nacional de Resistencia Popular, the National Res Popular Resistance Front, right? It was a grassroots organization doing protests, going out to the street to demand the return of Zelaya so he could finish his term and then they could have a legitimate election. Manuel Zelaya, I actually interviewed him, the guy who was the president who was ousted. Um, it's a little bit of a flex there. I felt proud of that interview, right? Um, I don't know how I got that. I do, but it was weird. I interviewed him and he told me personally he wanted to go back to having a political party. They had the Frente at first, but he's like, no, we want to create a political party so then we could defeat the illegitimate government, right? But then a lot of people said like, this whole political system now is illegitimate because of the coup. So as soon as you transform all that energy from the opposition of the Frente, which is on the street, into a political party, you're going to lose that steam. And many people say that's what's happened because they went and they created the Libre Party, Partido de Libertad y Refundación, um, Freedom and Refoundation, right? That's the name of the party. And many people say that, yeah, look, like this party now, because what Juan Orlando, the de facto dictator can say now, is he can say, 
well, we're not a dictatorship because even the men that I hate, I hate Manuel Zelaya, but he lives in Tegucigalpa and has his own political party. Um, yeah, so I actually, a lot of people would say that that formal organization serves to build this false premise that there is a democracy when there is not. Um, so yeah, um, in terms of I wanna not go on forever, relevant party, I don't think so personally, but the social movements, like I said, they fight very consistently. Um, and I would still say that any change would probably come from those guys, you know? And there's many of them, um, but yeah. So any other questions? We've got a question from Marika about how, how do you think, I know you've reported on, on the sort of starvation politics side of this, um, right. how have COVID and, and also the recent hurricanes affected this sort of whole political situation in Honduras? The hurricanes? Both COVID and the hurricanes. Yeah, separately, yeah. Separately altogether. So I, I think they're very similar dynamics, right? First of all, yeah. um, the hurricanes, as I'm sure everyone, if you're on this video call, you probably have a, you know, very, at least a base level of Honduras. Um, they totally wrecked the place. Like the place actually where we were with MS-13 in San Pedro Sula, that was mm -hmm. mostly wrecked. Um, these are poorly constructed slums with like corrugated iron roofs and wood posts holding them up and stuff like that. So when a hurricane hits, it's catastrophic, right? Um, in so many different ways. I actually did a piece recently on the effects of climate change in what's called the dry corridor, um, which Honduras is a part of, right? Basically what's happening, this connects also to the government response, right? But what's happening with climate change is that there's these massive droughts in the Northern Triangle, in Honduras, right? Which make the agricultural life of many people very difficult. Ironically, those people then go to slums in the inner city where there's gang violence and stuff because they can't live in the countryside. And when they can't live in the cities, they go to the US. Um, but what happens is that these droughts make the surface soil so parched and stuff like that, that it creates when hurricanes do come, and as we know with climate change, they're getting worse, it creates massive mudslides. It um, is catastrophic. And then, so it's really tragic that these people who, many of them left the countryside, they go to the slums, right? Landslides will just wipe out these slums too. Um, so anyways, to the government response, they did this and I did an article for El Faro. Um, we can send the link after if you're curious, um, cause I think the dynamic is very similar. Earlier this year, when quarantine started with COVID-19, basically the ruling party of Juan Orlando, the de facto dictator, they were politicizing who they sent food aid to during the quarantine, right? So they sent mostly uh, packages of emergency food to communities that were supportive of the national party. Um, and in only limited cases did they send it to um, parties or communities that supported the opposition Libre party that we were just talking about. Um, when people made petitions, made loud enough complaints or whatever, but they were just being very scummy and quietly trying to, uh, you know, bolster their support and stuff like that by incentivizing people to like them, right? Like, you know, no one really likes the National Party in Honduras, but if you're uneducated and stuff and the National Party comes and it's like, here's a burger, right? Like, of course, you know, someone will be like, yeah, I like the National Party. So I imagine, and I know there's controversy about this right now, but I don't want to pretend I'm an expert. Um, there's a big controversy over COPECO, which is one of the relief agencies following the hurricanes. And from what I understand, it's a very similar dynamic that the National Party is politicizing its response to people displaced by these catastrophic hurricanes. Yeah, absolutely. I think to add on to that also, you've got this sort of phrase going around at the moment of solo el pueblo, salva el pueblo, like only the people will, will save the people, which I think also points to the absence of the state in many areas and the fact that communities themselves have had to sort of support each other in the sort of initial rebuilding efforts. Obviously, it's going to be a long process. Yeah. Um... Wait, was that a question? Sorry, I, I no, that was just a, just an addition. Um, <laughs> unless you have any thoughts on, on on the role of state absence in in the aftermath of the hurricanes, there is. Um, let me see. What are some other questions that I'm trying to find? We've got. Um, do you think oh, international pressure? Yeah. Do you think international pressure regarding environmental regulations will have any impact, or, or could have any impact, on Honduras's government to halt the mining companies? 
Yeah. So actually, I think this is where maybe I won't be so horribly pessimistic. I mean, I, I, I fear that, you know, I've, everyone's going to go away from this thing and just have a bleak view of uh, human nature and stuff. And they're going to have a beer and cry. I don't want you to do that. Right. There's still hope in things. So with international, what is it? International pressure on these companies. There's a distinct example that I can use, um, which provides a little bit of bleak despair and a little bit of hope, right? So in the same place that we'd been focusing on a lot, the Bahawagwan Valley, where they're building this mine, but previously from 2009 to 2014, they had the campaign of assassinations. Um, these assassinations, so we can go into this story a little bit more, they were being carried out by kind of a trifecta of private security guards, of Honduran soldiers, and drug war hitmen who were paid by either of those previous groups to kill the leaders or members of peasant movements who were trying to reassert their right to collective land ownership where those land was owned or had been taken over by these massive palm oil companies. Um, this company was called Dinant. Um, and Dinant was complicit in supporting all of these kill killings, right? And also it's worth saying, and again, this is another window into how these large corporations, the government and the military are all connected in drug trafficking. Um, there was a WikiLeaks cable that came out. Um, WikiLeaks is infinitely useful. Uh, but in 2004, it was revealed that on a Dinant plantation, um, where the Honduran military goes a lot, right? Because they were patrolling. Um, there was evidence that the State Department knew that in 2004 on a Dinant plantation, a plane landed, unloaded, massive amounts of cocaine, that there were Honduran soldiers watching the plane. They burned the plane, took the cocaine, put it in trucks and took it off, right? So anyways, I'm going on a, a large path in explaining this. Dinant is supporting these killings, but Dinant is supported by the World Bank. The World Bank has a private lending arm known as the International Finance Corporation, right? The International Finance Corporation, the private lending arm, has kind of a, what's called the Compliance Advisor op advisor ombudsman, which basically watches for human rights violations by companies that the World Bank is subsidizing through the IFC. I know this is a bit complicated, but you'll see how it comes into effect. So when this campaign of killing starts because Dinant wants to get rid of these social movements who are defending the land that they're stealing, right? Um, the World Bank, through the compliance advisor op ombudsman, starts investigating Dinant. And then finally, by 2014, they come out with this scathing report that says, yeah, uh, well, we're sorry. Uh, it turns out that Dinant is kind of helping these killings, right? And Dinant stopped. They stopped. Now, there's the dark side is that there's actually, this is around when the Honduran state starts depending instead on infiltrating paramilitary groups into the communities instead of attacking them from the outside with hitmen and private security guards and stuff. That's another story. But nonetheless, it was the pressure of social movement activists, international solidarity activists, and journalists who brought light to this campaign of killing that pushed the compliance advisor ombudsman and the International Finance Corporation of the World Bank as a whole to stop Dinant from doing this. So I, I think that's a good window into seeing how, yeah, like um, there is way, there are ways to pressure these companies, I do think. So definitely nice. No, it's nice to have a, a, a slightly hopeful view on, on it as well. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't like being all doom and gloom either. I, what is the Gramsci quote? Uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism, of the soul. I think that's a good call. Anyways, I don't mean to ramble too long. Let's get some more questions for as long as we're still here. Yeah, we've got one from Juan here. Of how do you connect what's happening in Honduras with the situation in other Latin American countries, such as Guatemala, El Salvador, Colombia, where narco trafficking and mining are fueling the killing of social leaders with the complicity of local authorities, which remain in power with support of the US government and other geopolitical powers, such as China and Russia? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. And like I was saying earlier, I think it's important to understand Honduras because for the simple fact of human beings matter and they're suffering there and you should care about that. But also because Honduras is a perfect distillation to understand a lot of what happens in Latin America. So you mentioned Colombia, right? Um, Colombia is extremely similar in the pattern of how mining companies will go in. 
Colombia also, I mean, just slight historical background. I don't want to go on too long. Colombia has been having a civil armed conflict. It's technically over, but it's really not over. Um, where left-wing guerrillas are fighting right-wing paramilitaries. Both of them are in drug trafficking, more the paramilitaries, and then the government actively collaborates with the paramilitaries, right? In that context, mining companies, very similar to the ones in Honduras, will go to Colombia, create open pit mines. For example, in Colombia, there's one mine called the El Cerrejón mine, which is the largest open pit mine in the world. I mean, disgusting, right? I mean, it's caused massive uh, environmental damage. But the El Cerajón mine was defended by the AUC, which is the largest paramilitary, or members, ex-members of the AUC, the largest paramilitary army in Colombia, right? The AUC had to be technically disbanded because it caused too much, they massacred too many people and too much bad press, right? Um, but nonetheless, the members are still there and they just operate in smaller groups with different names in a similar systematic strategy where they kill environmental leaders indigenous leaders, union leaders, and stuff like that. So that's, there's a huge similarity. And actually an interesting thing, in 2009, it all comes back to the Pahuaguan, right? Because that's a distillation of what happens in Honduras. Um, when the campaign of assassinations started in 2009, there was actually evidence from Colombian journalists that they brought in former fighters from the AUC. And in the AUC, you've got to remember, these guys are hardcore, like they were waging hardcore guerrilla war against left wing guerrillas, right? So they know their stuff. There was evidence that 50 of those AUC fighters were brought by Dinant, the palm oil company, to go train their private security guards uh, who are killing these peasants, right? There's deep similarities. I don't want to go on forever, um, but it's a very similar thing in Guatemala. I could go into examples, but just the same, similar dynamic, right? And Something you mentioned in other geopolitical powers, such as China and Russia, a lot of people, especially people on the left, don't want to acknowledge this, but Venezuela is pretty terrible too, right? Um, this is a whole other conversation, but they have death squads and stuff like that too. But I would, from what I understand and from what other journalists who cover it, they would just say it's actually a slightly dysmorphed idiosyncratic version of the same system of transnational capitalism, which pushes for the exploitation of natural resources, right? The Venezuelan government just has its own state-owned corporations and, you know, uh, distributes or says that it distributes uh, the wealth from these mining projects better than other governments. They don't, but it's a similar pattern there too, right? Um, they dispossess indigenous people with militarized police units, such as the FAES and stuff like that. So yeah, um, I'd prevaricate, but I hope that that gave some good context to that question. Could you go into a little bit more depth about transnational capitalism? Yeah, I know I keep saying this, um, can be sort of like a buzzword, right? So, and also I've probably said neoliberalism at se several points. I think it's important to understand what neoliberal eh, neoliberalism is. Neoliberalism is a form of extremely deregulated capitalism. It emerged in the 1980s with Ronald Reagan in the US and Margaret Thatcher in the UK. And then throughout the 1980s, oftentimes with the IMF forcing third world countries to do it, like I was saying earlier, the IMF, they extort small countries to change their economies in exchange for getting debt relief, right? Um, so transnational capitalism is a part of neoliberalism because basically what happened is in the 70s and 80s when that shift to extremely deregulated capitalism happened, at that point, um, cap the capitalist class, so to speak, rich oligarchs and owners of massive corporations, they did not have to work through the modicum of individual nation states to be able to exploit labor and resources and stuff like that. Because now they had these international institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank and stuff that allowed them, that basically allowed them way more power and they were not limited by the nation state anymore. So when we talk about the transnational capitalist class, what it really is is about, it's like, as long as you're a part of the quote unquote 1%, right? Anywhere in the world, um, in environments like Honduras, if you have the money, you can go in and you can invest in a shitty, Oops, sorry, a terrible mining corporation, right? Um, so yeah, I, I'm trying to think of ways to not be too theoretical about this and explain transnational capitalist class, the global elites who benefit from this extremely deregulated form of capitalism, which is neoliberalism. And this is upheld by US hegemony in particular, 
US empire, so to speak, right? And by these governments, these puppet governments who all support the deregulated economies that the capitalist class can exploit with such ease because there are no environmental or labor regulations. Nice, nice, good answer. I was wondering also a little bit about your experience um, as a journalist working in, in Honduras, but in, in Central America more broadly as well, about how you've um, gone about tackling these kinds of these kinds of topics and how you found to be working in obviously a very violent context. Yeah, so um, the first thing I want to foreground, um, it's a danger of every foreign journalist to slip into a white savior complex, so I really don't want to do that. The first thing I want to say is it is far more dangerous to be a Honduran journalist. I mean, it is incredibly dangerous um, if you are working and investigating these similar things in Honduras, if you're not a white person, that the US government or the British government will get upset if you get killed, right? So um, let me just give an anecdote about this because I really wanna decenter myself from this and just use this as a window into how violent it is for Hondurans to be reporting there. Um, I have a friend actually, and he re recently got screwed over by the hurricane. Um, he lost his house and stuff like that. That's another thing. If you want, I can attach a GoFundMe. I've been trying to raise money so he can get uh, another house or fix his house. Anyways, when we reported on the mining corporation for the first time, we've done it a couple times. We met this guy who is a local journalist. First of all, his best friend was assassinated. Um, in 2010, Naum Palacios, his friend, was riddled with something of the order of 60 bullets from an AK-47. Um, his body was Swiss cheese, right? Not to be graphic, but I think people need to see that graphic reality, right? So his friend is already killed because of reporting on drug trafficking and corruption. So then Mario, our friend, as a local journalist, he knows that he can't personally cover a lot of these really hard hitting issues. He wants to, and he has better knowledge than us. But as a Honduran, he would get killed, right? And also a lot of these local news stations, they are bought out by the powers that be not, I don't mean that in any conspiratorial way, right? Like drug traffickers will go and threaten them and say, we'll kill you, but also we can give you money if you refuse to report on this, right? So, and this is a normal thing. If you talk to Honduran journalists, they're like, we cannot report on these things even though we know what's going on. So Mario helps us because that's his way of getting to this issue, right? To bring it to a bigger audience. Um, we go about, and it was kind of sketchy reporting while we were there. And there was two occasions where we were fairly certain that we were followed, um, which is a not necessarily pleasant experience, right? Um, but then afterwards, I get a WhatsApp message about uh, two weeks after I leave Honduras. And he says, I think they're gonna kill me. Because what happened is he was riding his bike in the same time we were reporting and a plateless brand new pickup truck comes, swerves in front of him, knocks, his, knocks him off his bike and a guy jumps out and says, excuse my French, uh, you're talking a lot of shit on that channel. You better get the fuck out of here. Again, excuse, I apologize, right? That's serious, his friend was killed. So he had to literally, um, we had to get the committee to protect journalists to help pay for his ticket. He had thankfully a, a visa or a passport, Spanish passport, but he didn't have the money to get out. So he had to go hide in the mountains to avoid getting killed. And he had to spend six months. He finally got out of Honduras, right? So yeah, there have been situations where me personally, I felt also just cause I'm a scared white guy, right? Um, you know, lightning freaks me out and stuff like that. Yeah, sure. I've been scared in situations, although there's definitely like kind of an adrenaline rush to certain things. Um, being with MS-13 felt like that, but Anyways, um, what was I saying? The thing is, is that even though it's a little bit scary for me, I know I probably won't die. There are some issues like drug trafficking. Other journalists will be like, yeah, they might kill a foreigner. But when you're covering like environmental corruption or killing of peasant leaders, they won't kill a white guy. They'd be more than happy to kill the Honduran working with him though. And that's what you should really focus on when you're talking about the journalistic experience in Honduras. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's a really, really important point as well of the protection that comes along with being a foreigner in Honduras, especially when talking about these kinds of issues. Um, I think we have come sort of to the end of the, the hour. Are there any other 
questions that I think we've covered all the ones in the chats, I believe, but feel free to jump in. Anything. An open box or an open book. Yeah. I appreciate everyone who came to listen about this and I hope that maybe you follow what's happening in Honduras a little bit more because I think again, when you see people coming to the US and stuff, uh, shoeless in the desert, um, thirsty as could be, uh, maybe this is a window into the systematic reasons as to why they'd be walk willing to walk across the Sonoran Desert um, with no water because it's worse to be in a slum in San Pedro Sula. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. <laughs> We've got Seth Berry connecting right now. Oh my God. Um, he missed it missed all. It. Yeah, um, very, for anyone curious, you should follow him and I can write it down, but he's the photographer I collaborate with very often. He's a gorgeous photojournalist. He does really great work. Um, and I was joking a second ago about how I'm terrified by lightning. He's absolutely fearless. So um, you should definitely follow him. Um, yeah, well, I think we can put both your and Seth's um, Twitter or Instagram or whatever you prefer into the into the Facebook event afterwards as well. So anyone who's interested in following your work going forward can can do that. Definitely. Um, let's see. Situation of one new message. No, mm. oh, I appreciate it, Flory. Um, yeah, I mean, something interesting, actually, I mean, that just made me think of it. Um, is that a lot of this is the frustrating thing. I mean, it happens in the US too. Like people don't understand why they're suffering. So then they vote for a, a fat racist who said that Mexicans are their problems, right? You know, uh, false consciousness. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to fat shame the president, but he deserves it. Anyways, um, I think something similar happens where even in many cases, many Hondurans, um, just because they're occupied with other things in their life, like they have to work like crazy to feed their kids because they're constantly stressed um, by just like the rigors of daily life, they can't sit down and have deep geopolitical conversations about how their government functions, right? So sometimes like, yeah, sure, Juan Orlando Hernandez, the dictator, he says, I'm fighting crime. And these poor people who are working like crazy, just as I would say, like a lot of the US working class that voted for Trump, they just kind of believe it, right? So it's, I wouldn't blame anyone even those who live in Honduras for um, supporting a terrible government. Now, if you're rich and you should know better in an education, then yeah, I would blame you, but you know what I mean? Um, oh, a question from Peter, progressive newspaper. I presume, well, one second. Oh, sweet. Um, okay, so Peter's question, you work for a progressive newspaper. Um, how does that help with your goal of speaking truth to power in Honduras? Um, well, I appreciate that that's what you see as my goal. I mean, I would hope that is too, right? I presume you're talking about The Nation magazine as well. The Nation is a really incredibly good magazine that is, they're not partisan, so they're not there to, um, you know, support any political group or organization. And at the same time, they're not tankies, so they're not a bunch of freaks who think that the CIA is running the world and that anyone who challenges left-wing people are you know, fascist murderers, right? But they are, have a progressive outlook. They want to help social justice struggles and very rigorous journalism. It's very easy to work with them because they're very meticulous about fact-checking, um, about supporting long investigations like the one we did about the mining corporation. I will say, and I have to be careful for my own career, I'm not going to drop names and I'm not even gonna say the publication. There are publications that I've worked with where putting in the context, like I was saying earlier, it's really bad when a lot of publications refuse to contextualize this violence, right? And then it, in the end, just kind of paints Hondurans as savage and stupid and violent. Um, perhaps it's because those writers actually maybe wanted to say that, but their publications didn't let them. I don't know if that's the case. I think those writers just didn't know. But there has been a publication where we've had to fight a little bit more to get certain context in like just even a, a single sentence mention of the fact that there was a military coup which allowed these illegitimate governments to pop up we did a i can't mention what story it is but we did a story where it was very important to mention that and of course the editor relented right you know we convinced her 
God dang it. Um, nonetheless, um, we convinced this editor that it was important and she put it in, but that is, depending on the publication, it can be difficult to put in that kind of political context that would explain the phenomena you're reporting on. Um, oh, so has Mario, your journalist friend who had to leave the country, been able to continue doing journalism or writing about Honduras? So he's a TV journalist. Um, he would do like video and stuff like that for a local TV channel. So while he was in Florida, I actually saw him once while he came to Florida. Um, he could not do that, right? And ever since he went back, he was actually threatened um, again when he came back uh, to Tacoa, the town where he lives, right? Um, after six months, he's safe now. Um, but yeah, another human rights worker, a Honduran one, she was telling me that when Mario came back, that members of a private security organization connected to the Pinatis mine had threatened him again, like came to his house and just said stupid stuff like, you know, watch out, man, we're going to come after you, stuff like that. So yeah, just another reason to remember why it's so, um, yeah, the kind of the constant violence against Honduran journalists who try to actually speak out. So, yeah. And I think also to, I mean, to, to go back to your, your GoFundMe for him as well, to support uh, local journalism is also so important because to get those, those views and those perspectives and that experience into reporting, I can imagine, or I don't know what you think about it, but is, is an important aspect of, yeah, it's important to have those views in journalism of local journalists. Yeah, and I actually should say, um, there is very much like a hierarchy of how journalism in these countries works too. You made me think of this. Um, it is that, so like foreign journalists come, um, I plan on moving to Honduras semi-permanently uh, starting in late January, right? I've just been going down on grant money and stuff like that. Um, you gotta be transparent about that, right? But nonetheless, so foreign journalists will pop down to Honduras for a week or whatever, do a story, but you can't learn all about a country in only one week, right? So you have to go to fixers who already know um, the layout of the region and stuff. And more often than not, those fixers are the local Honduran journalists who have vast knowledge of what's going on or it's human rights workers too. Vast knowledge of what's going on and they would report on it if they knew that their body wouldn't be turned into Swiss cheese by an AK-47, right? So they in turn go to the journalists who pop in a lot of times they're referred to pejoratively, justifiably sometimes as parachute journalists, you know, just drop into a country, tell a story and get out. And yeah, so I think that you have to remember that like with any story that you read, even the stuff that I write, and I like to think I'm a good writer, um, it is also the result of the physical and intellectual labor of on the ground fixers who are journalists themselves. Um, so yeah, you have to pay homage to that. Nice. It's also interesting to hear about how um, how those pieces sort of come to be and the the people behind behind that hard work and behind the writing. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you, Jared, so much for for your time and for everybody else for coming as well. I think for all the questions. I think this has been really really interesting. Thanks so much for providing such a nuanced and passionate perspective on everything that's going on in Honduras. Um, one thing to add uh, from an educate point of view, obviously we, we've um, really happy to have you all today. We do have an uh, sort of emergency campaign going on at the moment as well, which we'll also post um, you know, on the on the Facebook page along with, with Jared and Seth's uh, contact details or, or websites. Um, so we, we very much appreciate any, any also donations that are going towards our work in Honduras. We're supporting sort of really bottom up community led change in the public education sector uh, with a sort of long term view towards rebuilding in the aftermath of the recent hurricanes and the pandemic, obviously, as well. Um, yeah, so there's a lot, a lot going on there. You can also check out the, the link. Thanks for posting it in the chat there, Marika. The Chuffed campaign has all the information on it if you're interested in, in learning more about what Educate's doing in Honduras. Um, and yeah, thanks thanks so much, Jared. This has been really, really interesting and, and great. Yeah, thank you guys. I really appreciate you uh, 